All right, well, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Thank you again for joining us for our Advocacy Institute uh, today on the future of newborn screening. Uh, so thank you again for joining our monthly webinar series that the MDA Advocacy Team puts on on a number of different topics today focusing on uh, newborn screening. So let's move to the next slide. Let's uh, talk about uh, what we're talking about today. Um, so for, for one, we're going to start just with some introductions and then housekeeping items. We have some really amazing speakers with us today uh, to talk about the latest from Capitol Hill, as well as adding Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, into the newborn screening program. Uh, really excited about that possibility. And then finally, also talking about the future of newborn screening, uh, how newborn screening is, is evolving in very uh, exciting directions, uh, and we'll, we'll have uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll, uh, for those uh, who might not be familiar with newborn screening, we'll provide just a quick overview to start with. Of course, I uh, don't want to leave anybody behind, certainly, as we're talking about these exciting topics. Uh, mentioned a few ways for you to take action on newborn screening, for you to join us in advocating in uh, newborn screening. And then finally, we'll take your questions. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, and uh, let's, let's cover just a handful of housekeeping items before uh, we get started on the program. So for one, if you look at the very bottom left hand side of your uh, left hand corner of your screen, um, you will see a, a, a little closed captioning, a CC box there uh, in case uh, you'd like to uh, turn on subtitles or, or closed captioning as we're as we're moving along with the program. In addition to that, uh, we are happy to take your questions. Uh, we'll be taking some questions uh, during the program, questions that pertain to perhaps what we're talking about in that exact moment. So it will be topical to raise then. Uh, and we'll also be taking questions at the very end uh, as, uh, of the program as well, in case we weren't able to get to your question uh, during the program itself. The way to do that, you can see uh, on the very bottom right corner of your screen, uh, you'll see there's a chat box there. Uh, that is actually not the way to be submitting a question. We're going to ask you instead to click on the three little buttons or the three little uh, dots that you see there. Uh, you'll find Q&A uh, as, as an option there. And then feel free to uh, submit your question and uh, not only the MDA team, uh, but also our speakers will be able to see your question there and uh, we'll get to that question uh, whenever is appropriate to do so. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so just in case you can, let's say, only join for the first 20 minutes or you join late, uh, whatever it happens to be, uh, you can always find the recording of this webinar uh, on MDA's uh, YouTube page, also accessible through our MDA advocacy webpage. Uh, which uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more information on in a moment because that's also where you can join us to take action. Okay, so why don't we move along from here? Uh, I'm very excited to introduce to you uh, our, our really fantastic panel uh, talking about newborn screening uh, this afternoon or evening with you. So first we are joined uh, by Dr. Debbie Jessup. Uh, Debbie has uh, over 40 years of experience in nursing and midwifery, women's health and health policy. Uh, but since 2005, she's been the health policy advisor at the Congresswoman R uh, Lucille Royball Allard. Uh, and within this position, uh, she's been actively engaged uh, in health appropriations work, as well as helping the Congresswoman pass uh, a number of pieces of legislation, including, of course, legislation uh, directly uh, pertaining to newborn screening. Uh, so, uh, Debbie, Dr. Jessup, we're very appreciative of your time uh, this evening. Uh, we're also joined by Nikki Armstrong. Uh, Nikki is a board certified genetic counselor with Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, one of our partnering patient advocacy organizations. Uh, Nikki is the senior director of community research at PPMD, uh, community research and genetic services, excuse me. And uh, she leads PPMD's newborn screening efforts, including the submission of the recommended uniform screening nomination package for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So we'll be talking to Nikki about uh, the nomination of Duchenne to be considered for newborn screening. And then, of course, last but not least, we have Dylan Simon, who is the director of policy for the Every Life Foundation uh, for Rare Diseases. Uh, and so, since joining Every Life, uh, Dylan has focused on newborn screening and diagnostic policy issues in particular. And prior uh, to being at uh, the Every Life Foundation, uh, he was with the Senate Health Committee and worked uh, at uh, other advocacy organizations previous to that as well. And Dylan is uh, one of uh, Dylan is and Every Life is one of the organizations that is leading the charge in the discussion of how we innovate, how we reform newborn screening uh, for the next generation, uh, next generation of medicine, and next generation of uh, for those with rare diseases. So. Uh, Debbie, Nikki, and Dylan, we are so thrilled uh, to have you with us uh, this evening. And of course, there's me, uh, Paul Melmeyer, Vice President of Public Policy and Advocacy, your moderator for uh, for the for, for the day. 
OK, so before we get into any one particular topic that we're covering today, let's just level set on newborn screening. So uh, what exactly is newborn screening? Uh, some of you might uh, not actually be familiar with newborn screening as of yet. So newborn screening is the public health program uh, in which uh, babies, uh, nearly every baby born in the United States uh, is screened for a handful uh, at this point, uh, about 35 core conditions uh, for states that are screening for all core conditions and then additional secondary conditions from there. They're screened for these conditions uh, very shortly after birth, like heel prick, is taken and then blood is put onto a blood spot card about 24 to 48 hours after birth usually. And then that's sent off to a public health laboratory that screens for uh, these conditions, all of which are rare and all of which also uh, have some kind of intervention that if the disease is caught early and diagnosed early through confirmatory testing following that newborn screen, uh, then an intervention can be uh, pursued by uh, the family and by a, a, a physician or medical professional assistant the family and potentially some of the most challenging or detrimental aspects of the disease uh, can be avoided by early diagnosis and then early treatment. So because uh, this is a public health program, essentially every baby in the United States receives uh, newborn screening, essentially any, any baby that's born within a birthing facility. Uh, and uh, that is certainly uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of babies in the US. Um, and newborn screening is so critical because these are all diseases, again, that if not caught early, they can have very serious impacts on uh, the child. And we'll talk about some uh, neuromuscular conditions that qualify uh, for newborn screening here in a second. Um, but it's catching these diseases early that can actually uh, lead to uh, the avoidance of some of the most challenging experiences, for potentially even early death uh, due to these, uh, new, due to these uh, very serious and life-threatening uh, rare diseases. So that's newborn screening more generally, but what's the intersection uh, with neuromuscular conditions and the Muscular Dystrophy Association? Well, as of now, there are two uh, neuromuscular diseases that have been recommended to states for screening in the newborn screening program. We can move to the next slide. Uh, these conditions are uh, Pompe disease and spinal muscular atrophy. And the reason for why these two diseases of the many neuromuscular diseases, of course, that MBA uh, serves the population who has these diseases, the reason that these two diseases have uh, actually been recommended by the federal gov government for states to actually, uh, to actually screen for is because both of these conditions have treatments, uh, interventions that can actually avoid, if treated early, some of the most uh, uh, problematic, some of the most challenging, some of the most um, uh, potentially uh, life-threatening uh, experiences with Pompeii and with SMA. Of course, in the case of spinal muscular atrophy, there have been several treatments approved by the FDA over the course of the last uh, five to seven years, some of which uh, are, are truly transformative. In the case of Pompeii disease, especially for infantile onset Pompeii disease, if enzyme replacement therapy is administered early, uh, some of the most uh, challenging, some of the most uh, scary uh, symptoms of infantile on onset Pompeii disease, such as the cardiac symptoms, uh, can, can be uh, potentially avoided because of that. So uh, these two neuromuscular conditions are recommended by the federal government for newborn screening today. But as you can see, not every state screens for both conditions. Some states do indeed screen for both SMA and Pompeii at birth. You can see those uh, that are highlighted in orange on the map in front of you. Some states only are screening for SMA and not Pompeii. Those are the uh, pinkish color to me at the very least. And then some states are only screening for Pompeii, but not SMA. Those are the blue states. And then you'll see there are just a handful of states, North Dakota, Nevada, Alaska, Hawaii, for example, that are not screening for either as of yet. And the reason for this, uh, and I should also say that, uh, uh, that, um, that this, this is, can also be a little bit hard to define because some states have pilot programs, some states are testing them out. Uh, and so uh, this also states are always adding new conditions to their list. So we, we just updated this. Who knows? It could be updated already. Hopefully it is. Hopefully that means the state has added uh, one of these conditions to their list. But in any case, uh, the reason for why you see this diversity across the United States, if you can follow that, and we can move to the next slide, is because it's actually up to state governments on uh, which uh, new which conditions they're going to screen for uh, within their uh, within their programs. So each state has their own approach, has their own process. It might be uh, the legislature that has to pass a bill that says we're going to add Pompeii disease onto our newborn screening panel. It might be some process in which the public health department there goes through a process to add it. Um, it could be some law that actually after a period of time of being added by the federal government to the recommended uniform screening panel, 
uh, that's uh, the after a period of time after it's being recommended, uh, the state automatically adds uh, the uh, newborn screen, uh, that that condition onto their uh, panels. But the 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 moral of the story here is that it really is up to the state in deciding what uh, uh, what they want to actually screen for within that state. Um, now, uh, the reasons for why states can take a little while are, are many, and we're going to go into these because uh, there, there are certainly ways in which this can be addressed both at the federal level right now through legislation as well as appropriations, uh, but also in talking about kind of more broadly reforming uh, newborn screening, uh, ways in which uh, this, this process could be uh, accelerated or, or reformed entirely for that matter at the state level. But under our current paradigm, uh, it can be very expensive to add new diseases onto state newborn screening panels. And so states might balk at the expense of, of having to do so or having to hire additional lab uh, personnel to be able to do the extra work of doing the additional screen, or perhaps they have to buy the technology, they actually have to buy the, the machine to actually uh, do the screening within the state lab, or they don't even have room to, to put the new machine in the state lab. There are all sorts of different reasons for why states can take a little while to add some of the recommended uh, recommended screens the federal government puts forward to their panel. Um, and we're going to get into uh, what what can be done about this as we go along with our program. But as I've already alluded to, uh, newborn screening isn't only uh, isn't only influenced by states. The federal government still has a very important role to play uh, within the newborn screening ecosystem. At the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, uh, they have the Secretary's Advisory Committee on heritable disorders in newborns and children. And it is this committee that actually puts forward the recommended uniform screening panel to states for uh, what they would recommend. And really, it's actually the secretary that has to confirm the recommendation that the committee makes. But it's the committee that does, you know, 98% of the work. Uh, and it is they who then recommends that, hey, you know, uh, Arizona or hey, Michigan or hey, whatever state, uh, we're going to recommend that you add. Uh, SMA or Pompe disease, or hopefully not in the too distant future, Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, to your uh, to your state panel. And then HRSA also does a lot of additional uh, additional uh, efforts to assist states in ensuring that their programs are keeping up and uh, providing technical assistance and other assistance uh, as uh, as state programs are are uh, implementing their newborn screening programs. The Centers for Disease, the Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, also has a newborn screening focus program, and it is there that uh, they really are assisting the labs, the public health state laboratories that actually do the newborn screening. They assist with technical assistance and helping out with quality assurance and uh, really just uh, trying to, to take as much burden off of the state labs as possible because these state labs are, are overtaxed and underfunded as it is, and the CDC is there to try to help these state labs with not only um, the current uh, screens that that state lab might already be conducting, but also helping that state lab if they want to add a new screen or if the state legislature has added a new screen onto the state's uh, new more screening panel. And then finally, the NIH also has the Hunter Kelly uh, Research Program, and this is a program in which NIH is able to fund uh, pilot studies into newborn screening in which uh, NIH might be able to fund researching whether a new disease uh, could be appropriate for newborn screening. And so they'll actually test uh, in a pilot uh, manner whether that uh, newborn screen actually could be appropriate for a wider adoption across the United States. So the federal government certainly has a big role to play as well. And actually, this is a really good transition into our next topic and our next guest. And uh, this is, uh, again, this is uh, with, um, um, with, and we can move to the next slide. Um, with uh, uh, Dr. Debbie Jessup of uh, Congresswoman uh, Roybal Allard's office, because it is Congresswoman Roybal Allard's office, and Debbie in particular with the Congresswoman, who have uh, worked for, as Debbie said, 17 years uh, to ensure that the federal programs are, uh, are, are, are up to speed, they're well-funded, and that they have the resources and they have the authorizing language they need uh, at HRSA, at CDC, and at NIH to be able to assist the states in actually implementing uh, newborn screening. So with that, Debbie, I want to ask you uh, the very first question that I'm going to ask. And again, thank you again for uh, being with us here uh, this evening. So give us a brief history of the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act. And when did Congress really first get involved in newborn screening? Well, thanks for having me, Paul. I always love talking about newborn screening. 
Um, until the year 2000, newborn screening was totally a state or unfunded system. And at that time, there was tremendous variation in the number of qu and quality of state newborn screening tests being offered. Some states were screening for as few as four conditions at that point and others for as many as 50. But most states were only screening for about six disorders. So in 2000, the Children's Health Act authorized the very first federal funding through HRSA for the Maternal and Child Health Bureau to invest in newborn screening activities and to develop federal guidelines for state testing. Um, in 2002, HRSA used that money and asked the American College of Medical Genetics to develop guidelines for newborn screening. And so the ACMG looked at 81 conditions and they placed 29 of them on a core screening panel. And that made up the original RUSP that we now have more, more than that on, but the RUSP that we're still using. Now, when that happened, um, members of Congress realized that if you were going to try and encourage states to cover more conditions, that meant finding some funding to help them do it. Because all of those activities Paul talked about take money. Now, the federal government can't force the states to do any of this because this is a state-run system. So you needed to sweeten the pot and encourage them to do it. And that meant finding funding to help them do it. Um, in 2002, my boss, along with Congressman Simpson, and in the Senate, Senators Dodd and DeWine introduced the very first uh, original Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act. Um, that year, um, we got a few, we got a few co-sponsors, but the bill didn't really move. And in February 2003, HRSA went ahead and formed, and the secretary formed an advisory committee on heritable disorders in newborn and children. They formed it, but it was never congressionally directed. So it was always at risk, but they put it there and they started meeting to discuss um, what for conditions to recommend. It took three Congresses and six years to sign to pass the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act, and it was signed into law on April 24th in 2008. Um, by April 2011, three years after the newborn screening bill became law, all states were testing for at least 26 disorders. So the bill had a tremendous impact on encouraging states to incorporate the disorders onto their screening panels. Most bills in Congress are authorized for a period of five years. So the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Authorization ended April 24th in 2013. Um, my boss introduced a reauthorization bill that year along with Congressman Mike Simpson. And um, in the Senate, both of the original Senate sponsors, Dodd and DeWine, had retired. So two new sponsors took this on, Senator Kay Hagan and Senator Orrin Hatch. Um, the bill passed in December of 2014. And so that first reauthorization of the newborn screening bill lasted from December of 2014 until September of 2019. And we are now currently functioning without an acting authorization, trying to pass a second reauthorization of the bill. Yeah, that's right, Debbie. Thank you. Uh, that's excellent. Excellent explanation. So, so tell us about the bill that uh, that your boss and you are leading on right now, and that many of our organizations are united behind. Tell us about the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act, and within that bill, uh, what provisions are included, and what changes would the le legislation uh, make to the federal programs that we've already discussed? So, the bill really um, maintains and expands the four major programs that you already discussed. So it reauthorizes the HRSA grants to help states improve their screening programs and to educate parents and healthcare providers and to provide follow-up care for infants with conditions detected through newborn screening. Um, the bill renews the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders. Um, so that would maintain the federal role of updating the recommended uniform screening panel. Um, the bill reauthorizes the programs at the CDC, which provide the technical assistance to state newborn screening programs 
to track the outcomes of infants identified through newborn screening and um, also the newborn screening quality assurance program to make sure that the laboratory tests are all meeting the recommended quality standards. Um, and it also reauthorizes the um, NIH Hunter Kelly Newborn Screening Program, which funds the research aimed at identifying new treatments and new screening technologies. So the only thing new in the bill um, is that this bill would commission a National Academy of Medicine report to make consensus recommendations um, to shift newborn screening to a 21st century newborn screening system to look at how we're doing things now, a state versus a federal system and all of the things that go along with the system to see if we need to update things. Yeah, no, absolutely. So so what um, what progress has been made in, in, in trying to pass the bill? And is, is it bipartisan? And and who, of course, aside from your boss, uh, is, is really uh, you know, supporting the legislation, really leading on the legislation? So this has always been a very bipartisan effort. It's one of the few things that I've had the opportunity to work on in Congress that was so strongly bipartisan. Um, Congressman Mike Simpson is still my boss's major partner on this, but we have brought on two other um, members in the House, Congresswoman Catherine Clark, who's a Democrat, and Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler, who is a Republican. Um, and the four of those members have introduced this bill in two different Congresses now. So we introduced the bill in 2019 um, and passed it about four months later, um, strongly bipartisan, no problem. It had 50 bipartisan co-sponsors, but it was taken up by the committees without hardly any pressure on them because of number one, the strength of the members pushing for it, but also number two, because of the work that all of you all do um, and all of the newborn screening advocacy organizations that really push for this. It's, it's an amazing coalition and it's been very powerful in Congress. Um, so the Senate bill, uh, once again, the senators leading the bill were both gone. One of them had passed away. One of them was not reelected. So the Senate bill um, in 2019 in the 116th Congress was introduced by Senator Maggie Hassan, a Democrat from New Hampshire, um, and um, Senator Cory Gardner. Senator Cory Gardner was only... It was not reelected after the 116th Congress, and the bill did not pass the Senate in the 116th Congress. So once again, in the 117th Congress, we started again. We introduced the same four members, and the House introduced the bill. And in the Senate, um, Senator Maggie Hassan um, was joined by uh, Senator Roger Wicker, who is a Republican from Mississippi. Um, so. The House bill passed again within about four or five months with about 57 bipartisan co-sponsors, and that was in um, 2021. But since 2021, the bill has been stalled in the Senate. Um, there's just been no progress despite multiple attempts to bring together House and Senate leaders to forge a compromise. And I'll just without going into a lot of details about it, I'll say the, simply that the holdup in the Senate is Senator Rand Paul, who would like to use this bill as a vehicle to change the privacy and informed consent rules for NIH research. And rather than having a bill of his own to do that, he's decided to use the newborn screening bill as a crutch to try and make a major change in how research is, um, is approached through NIH. Yeah, that, that that's right, uh, Debbie. And uh, this has been an issue that Senator Paul has has had now for eight years, I think, maybe maybe longer, going back to 2014 <laughs> at the very least, maybe maybe even earlier than that for that matter. But uh, absolutely right that uh, we continue to have uh, challenges, to put it mildly, getting it uh, through the Senate. So, with advocates on uh, on the line tonight live, we're going to watch this recording uh, afterwards. What would you recommend that advocates who who want to see this legislation move? Uh, do as a congressional staffer yourself, what is effective for advocates as they are reaching out to their senators or their representatives asking uh, for their support in the screening? Well, you don't need to ask 
representatives for anything at this point. So you shouldn't really waste a lot of energy talking to House members about the bill since it's already passed. But um, it is very important to be speaking to your senators. Um, I think the, the most important, as many Senate co-sponsors as we can get, that would be wonderful. But the most important thing is to reach out to Republican senators. The more Republican co-sponsors we get on the bill and supporters that we can get, the stronger will be the argument to override Senator Paul's objection. Um, and the most important Republicans you can reach out to are Republicans on the Senate Help Committee. Um, the other thing I think, you know, that if any of you all feel inclined that would be really important to do is to reach out to Senator Paul's office and share with them stories of why this bill is important and ask him to allow the bill to move forward. I would love to see his office overwhelmed with calls by people asking him to move this bill forward and to, and to lift his hold on the bill and allow all 4 million children born every year to have the benefit of newborn screening being authorized and funded appropriately. Yeah, well said, Debbie. And uh, MDA does have an opportunity, uh, and I thank you uh, for, for Mark, who just, just put that in the chat. Go to the chat box and you'll uh, find uh, the link to go to MDA's advocacy webpage, where just with a few clicks, you can send a note uh, to your senator uh, and in particular, if, if you're aware you live in a, a state in which you have a Republican senator who, who represents you, especially important, as Debbie said, uh, to be reaching out to them, asking for their support uh, for the, the Newport Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act, and that's S350 on the Senate side. So we've been talking a lot about authorizations, but as Debbie, is, as you know better than anybody, it's, it's so important to, of course, appropriate funds uh, for these programs. So. Uh, perhaps you can give us an update on the current status of appropriations uh, for newborn screening and if there's anything that advocates uh, can do to help out on that effort. Sure. So, you know, many people think that once you get a bill passed, you're done with your advocacy. But that's why there are so many bills and programs that have never been funded or only funded marginally. And people will ask several years later and say, I thought we passed a bill to do this and it's not happening. Well, it's not happening because people stopped their advocacy and didn't actually get the bill funded. Um, each year the president proposes a budget for all the federal agencies and programs, and then each year Congress has to pass appropriations bills to fund those agencies and those programs. So those programs that we talked about in HRSA and in the CDC and in the NIH need to be funded every year through appropriations. Newborn Screening Saves Lives has been extremely fortunate to have its four very strong champions who are all appropriators. And that's made a huge difference in, um, in making sure that the newborn screening programs have gotten very robust funding each, ro each appropriations cycle. And because of that, we've been able to get the funding for these programs to almost double that of what they were actually authorized at. Um, and that has allowed us to argue for increasing significantly the authorization levels in the bills that we're trying to pass right now. Um, so I, it's very important. The House has already passed its appropriations bill. The Senate has not. Senate has not even introduced it yet. So again, in the Senate, to ask the senators that you're speaking with to fund the newborn screening programs at the highest levels they can fund them would be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one final question for you, Debbie, and, and um, you know, your, your boss, Congresswoman Roseville Allard, has been a, a champion of newborn screening, as, as you've outlined, for, for two decades at this point, going back at least until uh, 2002, I believe you said. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, for all of us in the newborn screening world, she was retiring at the end of this year. Uh, so, so tell us about her dedication to newborn screening. Why this has been an issue that has just resonated so strongly with her. Um, well, you know, that, that predated me by a few years, but um, I, I think in what she remembers back and will tell me now is that when the conversations were starting to happen shortly after the Children's Health Act was passed and, and we realized that we needed to have some federal programs to address this, 
um, Congresswoman had um, had a grandchild born with a significant birth defect. It was not a birth defect that would have been picked up by newborn screening, but that opened her eyes to what it feels like for a parent to face a child with a very serious disability. Um, and so as she learned about newborn screening, it was something she could get involved with that made her feel like she was doing it in honor of her grandson. Um, and I that really drove her. Her grandson lived to be five years old and she still talks about him very tearfully as being one of the reasons that she has championed as many programs for children and children with disabilities as possible. Well, we're, we're sure gonna miss her. We've been so fortunate to have her leadership over uh, these last uh, 17 and 20 years at, at, at this point, and uh, she is truly irreplaceable, uh, as are you for that matter, Debbie. So uh, we're hoping that both of you will stay active in newborn screening even beyond this year, uh, if possible. But um, with that, uh, again, Debbie, thank you so much for the time uh, and talking about the latest from Capitol Hill. Uh, and if you're willing to stick around, we might have some questions at the end. Uh, Absolutely. On, 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 the, on the legislation. And uh, before we turn to Nikki, I also want to say, John, I see your second question in the Q and A. We're going to get to that one. I really like that question, but I want to I want to save that to the end because I think it's going to be most relevant as we talk about some additional topics toward the, the end of our conversation. All right. So moving on to our next topic, uh, Nikki Armstrong, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us this evening. As I've already uh, outlined, uh, Nikki is with Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy and is PPMD, who is leading the charge on adding uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy to the recommended uniform screening panel. We're early on in that process, as Nikki will tell us, but we're hopeful that in, not, in the not so distant future, Duchenne will be the third neuromuscular disease that's actually re recommended by the federal government uh, for screening. So Nikki, my very first question for you is, uh, what motivated PPMD to lead this effort uh, to pursue uh, a recommended uniform uh, screening panel uh, placement for Duchenne? And then from there, tell us if obtained, if actually Duchenne is added to the RUSP, uh, what benefits could uh, this federal recommendation for newborn screening actually bring to those with Duchenne or to the future generation of those born with Duchenne muscular dystrophy? Well, thanks, Paul, and thanks for the invitation to talk today. I appreciate that. Um, so your first question is a great one, uh, and it's really a combination of factors. Uh, Duchenne is a disease process, the availability of treatment, and the availability of a good screen. It's all those combination things. Uh, PPMD has long supported the benefits of early diagnosis. Uh, we know that Duchenne is a disease that progresses over time. So over time in Duchenne, muscle is lost. And for the most optimal benefit from treatment that increase, increase dystrophin, we know that treatment needs to start early uh, when most muscle is remaining. We've had treatments approved in the Duchenne space. There are now five approved therapies, four of which are not age restricted. So that was a big motivator. And then the last piece was actually the newborn screening test itself. Uh, so the test is actually done on the dried blood spot. Uh, the pilots over the last few years have used a test called CKMM. Um, that's a specific kind of CK made by the muscles. And uh, a couple of years ago, a, a kit developed by Perkin Elmer received FDA authorization. So that means that the kit was just demonstrated to be effective. So in Duchenne, CKMM is very elevated, um, but then you need a follow-up test to confirm the diagnosis. And so then you need genetic testing to confirm the diagnosis. So the other piece is that Duchenne genetic testing has improved a great deal over the last few years. And so now you can do one genetic test to identify the vast majority of genetic changes in Duchenne. And that test can now be done on the same dried blood spot that's used for newborn screening or a cheek swab. So the follow-up testing is that much easier. So it's really that combination of all those different pieces that came together that made it be now the right time to really push forward our efforts. I think that answers your first question. Uh, your second question as to the benefits of the recommendation. Um, well, there's kind of two pieces to that. The benefits of having a federal recommendation is it will make the process of adding Duchenne to state panels that much easier. Uh, states, some states already have what we call rust alignment legislation. My guess is Dylan will talk more about that. Um, that but that will allow the uh, Duchenne to move and be added in those states essentially automatically. It also provides, you know, having this RUSP approval stamp provides an assurance to other states that Duchenne newborn screening has really been reviewed in depth and it's effective and it's beneficial. Now, when we think about families, 
I think it really helps to consider what we know about diagnosis now. So we know right now that the average age of diagnosis is between four to five years of, of age, and that hasn't changed in 20 years, even though many, many people have worked very hard to try to decrease that average age of diagnosis. We also know that the average diagnostic odyssey is about two years. Uh, that means that most families notice symptoms and worry and try to find an answer for about two years before they get a diagnosis. And for many families, that diagnostic odyssey is expensive and it's exhausting and it's frustrating. The newborn screening will mean no more diagnostic odyssey. The other thing to keep in mind is that while the average age of diagnosis is four to five, we all know families where kids were not diagnosed with Duchenne until seven or eight. And at that age, there may be less benefit from the therapies and a loss of opportunities to participate in clinical trials. In Duchenne, we have an amazingly robust clinical trial pipeline, but most of those trials are recruiting from ages four to seven. So kids that are diagnosed later have less opportunities. The other thing is that research has shown that the diagnosis is not equitable. Where you live and your race really affects when you're diagnosed, with non-Caucasian and high poverty families having a much later age of diagnosis. We also know that kids who have autism, kids who have other developmental disorders uh, that are diagnosed first are often late to be diagnosed with Duchenne. So newborn screening means that all kids with, diag with Duchenne are diagnosed early. So we don't have to worry about anyone missing out on opportunities, for early optimized treatment or clinical trials. Everyone can be monitored or evaluated for developmental disabilities and get any appropriate therapies at a young age. Families won't have the diagnostic odyssey and it's gonna be equitable because every baby in the country gets it. Every baby will have the diagnosis early. And last piece is that newborn screening has benefits for the entire family. Uh, we know that many mothers are carriers and as being carriers, they're at risk for cardiac disease. Uh, so once a baby is identified in the family, testing is often uh, needed for other family members and identifying them early can also lead to increased screening for them and uh, potential treatments if they need it. And as well as long-term planning for families, thinking about you know, where to live or what kind of house to get or family planning, there's all sorts of benefits to families from newborn screening. Absolutely, yeah, no, well said, Nikki, absolutely. So, so tell us a little bit about what evidence the committee requires in order for that committee to then uh, recommend uh, a new disease to be added to the recommended uniform screening panel. And uh, from there, um, how does it appear that Duchenne meets the evidentiary requirements that the committee would wanna see? Sure, uh, so the nomination package uh, has a, you know, a series of uh, sections, essentially, or parts of that package that you have to complete. Yeah, the package requires that a condition be serious, uh, that the condition be well-defined. So we have to know about a lot about the condition. Uh, there has to be a pilot that um, has been conducted and successfully identifies at least one baby with the condition. Uh, there has to be a screen that is good and a follow-up test that is good, meaning that they can identify babies that have the condition, but not identify too many babies that don't have the condition. And then the last piece is that there must be treatment. So some of those pieces are a very easy you know, check off the box. Um, Duchenne is definitely serious. It is a life limiting condition and it, it has significant disability. And the spectrum of Duchenne and Becker are really well understood. So those, those pieces are, are very easily crossed off. Um, there have been multiple pilots in, in the recent past, uh, the PPMD New York State pilot, as well as the uh, pilots, the RTI pilot with MDA funding that have both identified at least one baby with Duchenne. So that section is also well covered within the, the package. Uh, and the screen, the CKMM assay is FDA authorized, which again, shows that it is, um, it is a very effective screen. Although we actually don't know yet about false negatives, which would be where a baby is missed, because that can take years, like probably four or five years before that baby will be diagnosed and we would know that. So I would say the hardest piece within the package and I have no crystal ball, so I do not know how the committee will go, but I think the hardest piece within the package is the treatment piece. Um, because what the treatment piece that they want is that data showing that early treatment results in better outcomes. And that's something that's been very difficult in Duchenne. Uh, we have therapies, including the exon skipping therapies that are approved for all ages, which means that there's certainly an option for any eligible babies identified on newborn screening. 
The problem is that only about 30% of people with Duchenne have an eligible genetic variant. And these therapies are relatively new. So we don't have a lot of data on the little ones or who, are, who have been treated with them. The other piece is because the progression of Duchenne is something that happens slowly over time, it can take actually a really long time to understand the benefits of a therapy. So it's, it's hard to know with those therapies um, if there is enough data based on that. But that being said, there are so many other important benefits from newborn screening, including the early intervention services like language therapy uh, and therapies for autism and physical and occupational therapy and the benefits to the families, the options to participate in clinical trials, so lots of other benefits as well, but it's difficult to know how the committee will view those benefits. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, I wish wish we had that crystal ball as well, Nikki, but uh, absolutely still lots of uncertainty from here on exactly how the committee will um, evaluate the, the package that was submitted. Uh, but tell us a little bit about the process, perhaps, especially the timeline that we can expect as the committee is looking at the nomination. Of course, it was submitted on uh, June 30th, I believe, was the big day in which the nomination uh, was officially put forward. Uh, what does the process and timeline look like from here? Sure. So right now, the package is in the initial step of HRSA review. Uh, so that's a step where it's essentially being checked for completeness. Um, it's important to understand that the finished document with all of its pieces is hundreds of pages. I think we might have hit a thousand pages with everything. So that step of reviewing for completeness is, is not actually a, a super fast one. So that's where it is right now. There's also at least one condition ahead of us and the committee only has the ability at this point to review so many conditions at a time. So it's, it's not clear how long we're gonna be stuck, I shouldn't say stuck, how long we're going to be in this stage. Once we get past the part where the package is considered complete, it will go to what's called the nomination and prioritization work group. Uh, this group does sort of the initial review to answer some key questions. So they look for the seriousness of the condition, the screening test, the pilots, and the treatment, but they're just doing a brief view of it. And then they were present a report to the committee and the committee either votes yes for it to go on. Uh, and if it goes on, it gets a more detailed review process or no. If they vote no, they get feedback on what is missing. If they vote yes, it goes to this external review group that's called the evidence-based evidence review group. And that group is made up of experts outside of the committee. And those folks delve deep into all of the evidence, uh, it, like pulling all the literature possible. They also present their findings to the committee meetings over time, and um, eventually the committee votes. Uh, based on the um, 2014 reauthorization of the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act, the committee has nine months from the time of accepting the nomination package to the time of a vote. So that's essentially nine months from when the nomination and prioritization work group presents and they vote yes to move on to the next vote at the end of the evidence review group. If the committee votes yes, a recommendation is then provided to the secretary uh, of HHS and that secretary makes the final decision, as you said earlier. If the committee votes no, then the nominators are provided with details of what's missing. So there's a lot. Um, All together from the initial submission to the HH secretary sign off, the process typically takes a couple of years, um, although it has taken longer in some cases. Uh, and during the process, we can submit any updated or new data at any point, although that can occasionally slow things down. And of course, this process does not include all of the efforts that are going to be needed after this to bring it to individual states. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even if all of this is successful, it all goes perfectly well. And we, you know, however many two years, let's say from now, a knock on wood, uh, the secretary actually does recommend it. Uh, if we went back to that map at the outset of our call, I'd be blank because unless something happens in the next two years of a state adopting Duchenne prior to RUSP, uh, RUSP uh, inclusion, which, you know, could happen, uh, would have a 50 states in DC and a territory effort to go from there. Uh, to get to Shen on to uh, each state panel under our current system at the very least. So one final question for you, Nikki, and um, then we should move on. So as, as you've uh, gone this far in the process, and as we've talked about, there's still a long way to go still. What have you learned about uh, this process that could be helpful for other communities, either within neuromuscular diseases or outside for that matter, as they might be considering uh, nominating uh, their condition or a condition that uh, they're interested in? Uh, for newborn screening? Sure, I, I think the biggest thing I've learned is that it's all about collaboration. 
and the collaboration across many stakeholder groups. Um, the pilot and the Rust nomination package are huge undertakings, and they require expertise and support and funding and time from so many different experts and stakeholders. Um, we had pediatricians, parents, neuromuscular specialists, geneticists. We had amazing industry partners, uh, folks from the laboratory and the state newborn screening laboratories all weighing in during the development of this. Um, it, so, and then we of course had our partners with you all, with RCI and the MDA uh, and the pilot in North Carolina. And we also had the pilot uh, in Boston, the Curie Shen Brigham and Women's Pilot, all contributing efforts. So it's important to understand that like collaboration is really key here. Um, also, it's important to understand that this takes a huge amount of time. Literally, this, this package is the culmination of decades of efforts of various groups over the course of things. Uh, the last thing I would say is that really use the available, if you're considering doing the Rust package, really use the available resources that are provided by groups such as Every Life and MBSTRN, uh, as well as reaching out to groups that have already led packages through. So MPS Society, CureSMA, and others have been incredibly helpful in sharing what worked for them and different approaches. Uh, so it's, it's a really great community from that perspective with lots of partners that have been willing to help and we're incredibly grateful to them all. Yeah, well, it certainly takes a village, but it also uh, takes a leader. And Nikki, you've been that leader and PPMD has been that leader. So we're very grateful for uh, all the work you've been doing over the course of the last many months on this and many months ago still, as we've we've mentioned, but uh, at least for tonight, Nikki, thank you for that. And thank you for uh, your time and giving us this overview. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so let's move on to our final topic. And uh, here we are 12 minutes to the hour and still so much to talk about. It's possible we might drift a few minutes past 8 p.m. Eastern time. Apologies for all of you, all of you who have other things to do this evening, but hopefully you can stick around for just a couple extra minutes. In any case, I'm very excited to welcome in Dylan Simon with the uh, Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. And Every Life is when uh, one of the leaders talking about how we uh, get to the next generation of newborn screening, essentially how you've heard about some of these challenges in our current process, both from Debbie as well as from Nikki. Maybe those don't need to be uh, such challenges going forward if we're able to really innovate uh, within our newborn screening ecosystem. So uh, Dylan, first, welcome. And then second, uh, for my first question for you, um, are there discussions ongoing about reforming the process for adding conditions to the recommended uniform screening panel? That process we just heard Nikki give an overview of. And then if so, uh, what reform ideas uh, perhaps have been put forward to actually speed up this process that's currently used by the Secretary's Advisory Committee? Uh, great, and, and thanks for having me, Paul. Uh, excited to be here. Uh, always happy to talk about important screening. Uh, and I think the short answer is yes, that we're having these conversations. Uh, I think uh, what was talked about earlier in terms of the modernization study is a, is a great place to highlight that in terms of this was in the uh, original reauthorization bill uh, for the current round of reauthorization that we're still working to pass. Uh, and so that would really take a take that effort to really look at how do we modernize this, the current newborn screen landscape. Um, it's currently considered one of the most successful public health programs in the country, but we also know with the incoming wave of gene therapies that the amount of conditions that want to utilize newborn screening to address that diagnostic odyssey that it talked about is going to greatly increase. Uh, and there's going to be more and more conditions that meet that requirement of having treatment available. And so we know that that wave is coming. And so essentially, what do we need to do now? But what conversation do we need to have today to ensure that newborn training remains one of the most successful health, health programs? Uh, and so the National Academy study is a great place to start. But while we were waiting for the reauthorization, uh, Every Life Foundation, as well as other partners in the space, uh, and those are Sarepta, Orchard, uh, Bimer, and Javier Therapeutics, our industry partners, uh, helped to fund a study at RTI International. Uh, so RTI is a new leader in newborn screening uh, it, based out of North Carolina. And what we asked them to look into was what are some ways, what are some possible solutions to modernize newborn screening? Uh, and so what they were able to do was to uh, bring in stakeholders across uh, the newborn screening landscape and really ask uh, some really important questions. Uh, and so to answer your question more directly, uh, one of the things that came out was the, the need to align programs across federal agencies and, and that ability to allow for these agencies to talk to each other a little more, uh, to have a better understanding of what is in the pipeline, what is not in the pipeline, to have a, a better understanding of what is needed at the state level uh, can be really impactful and can really help to increase uh, and really change the way that we look at newborn screening. Um, but and within that RTI paper, they had these top rate solutions. So the line federal programs was one of them uh, that I just highlighted. Uh, and how they define and top rated was essentially ones that the stakeholder groups uh, over 85% deemed as would be effective. 
Uh, and so there were seven solutions that came out, most of which I'll probably touch on throughout today's call. Um, but it's also highlight, important to highlight there, there were a bunch of solutions that fell below the 85% threshold. Uh, and that was for a variety of reasons, but I think it's important to highlight that because it does suggest, does highlight the fact that there are a lot of ideas floating out there. Uh, and very few are, are bad. Most all, most all of them uh, require some additional conversation and where can we go? So I think a, a great comment would be, or one of the solutions would be, especially in this framework was the idea of bundling disorders uh, and submitting a Ross nomination package uh, that would look at uh, multiple conditions instead of going one by one as we currently go. Uh, and so that was one idea that didn't quite meet that 85% threshold, uh, but it was definitely one of the, an interesting idea that, came, that was proposed in the RTI paper. Uh, in addition, I want to highlight the fact that uh, our community Congress, which MDA is, is a great member of, uh, when we spoke to the advisory committee in May, uh, we recommended that they need to look at how to Im increase the amount of conditions they can review in a given year. Uh, and so part of that is just increased funding, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that, about that uh, later. And definitely that's going back to Debbie's point of appropriations is so important. Uh, there needs to be the funding because currently at the moment, the advisory committee only has the ability to review two conditions in a given year. Uh, and so the advisory committee is currently having a conversation about how to prioritize that, and we want them to focus on not how do you prioritize if multiple conditions are coming in, but how do you review more conditions? And so that's uh, some of the conversations that are happening right now around the review process. Uh, absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely right that if uh, the committee can only review two in any given year, and in the case of Duchenne, for example, if uh, Duchenne needs to wait for a current review to, to finish up, uh, or at least get to a kind of a, a, a pause, I suppose, um, that is only further delaying the process potentially of uh, babies being born with these uh, conditions being able to be screened at birth. So uh, certainly a delay that uh, we want to do anything that we can to uh, prevent from happening. Um, so fr from there, I want to ask Dylan about what discussions, if any, are ongoing about reforming what conditions could or should actually qualify. So uh, even, you know, uh, you know, moving away from the process and timeline oriented questions, but more so just what are the actual conditions that should qualify for the recommended uniform screening panel? Are there any conversations on changing what should qualify and what should be rec rec recommended by uh, the, the, the committee? Uh, sure. Again, short answer is yes. Uh, I think uh, you'll see uh, there are conversations occurring about a lot of things around how to improve newborn screening, uh, and they're in depth, important conversations. And, and again, two solutions that came up in the RTI paper, the RTI paper that didn't hit that 85% threshold. Uh, one was essentially looking at the net benefit considerations, and so this idea of when approving a condition for the advisor, for the Rust, they want to look at essentially what are the pros and cons of adding the condition, and, and does that. Does, how much do the pros outweigh the cons, essentially? And, and so do we need to relook at that? Do we need to relook at kind of what those metrics are that Nikki talked about? Um, in addition, there's conversations around a provisional RUSP. Uh, if there are conditions out there that everybody generally expects uh, is, is a fit for newborn screening, but doesn't necessarily have all the data it needs yet, uh, what do you do? Because, because these are all rare diseases and the nature of newborn screening, the nature of rare diseases, uh, once you begin newborn screening, you gather so much more data to be able to prove the fact that it is should be on newborn screening panel. So can we include a provisional RUSP that will ensure the fact that we can start collecting that data earlier? Uh, but again, I, I want to highlight the fact that there are uh, detractors of comments like that. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, make it seem that there are these are the two ideas that have risen to the top because the, the your question is, is first and foremost a great question, but does bring up a lot of conflicting opinions on this. So I think it's important that we're having these conversations now. Uh, and the way I would like to talk about it is we, we're knowing about that incoming wave of gene therapies, and we have to have this conversation around modernization, and it's important that we're having it now. I think we're on time for these conversations. There are important improvements that need to be made to the new screening system, and that's what the reauthorization does uh, address. Uh, but having these conversations now will really help set us up for the future, because if we're having these conversations five to 10 years from now, when that wave reaches us, then we're going to be behind. And so it's important that we're having these conversations now. And so we need to sort out what will actually work. What are the improvements to the newborn screening system that need to we need to start working on today? Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. Very well said indeed. Um, so to, to moving to, to a different facets or different parts of the newborn screening ecosystem uh, that also is challenging uh, for many organizations in, in trying to advocate for the inclusion of 
their uh, disease in question to uh, into new more screening. It's one thing to touch on the process for actually nominating the condition and what would then successfully be nominated. And as Nikki outlined, the you know months, if not years, it can take uh, to actually successfully complete that. But from there, as we said, even if Duchenne, for example, is indeed uh, successfully nominated. Uh, it could take a very long time. And in fact, in other conditions such as uh, skids, if you're combined immunodeficiency, uh, it took a decade from nomination until all 50 states, DC, and the territories actually uh, included skid within their newborn screening panels. 10 years it took from not from successful nomination uh, to skid actually being on every state panel. And as we saw with Pompeii and SMA, we're still working on it. So, Dylan, tell us about what, uh, what what can be done, what efforts are being pursued that could actually speed up that process so it doesn't have to take 10 years for all states to actually incorporate the recommended conditions onto their panels. That's a great question, and I think uh, it's important to highlight the fact that on average it's taking five to six years, and so that's incorporating the best states that are adding conditions within 18 months to a year, and, and so still on average you have talking about skid taking 10 years, which took obviously way too long, but even when you're trying to find the best numbers, which would be the average, it's still five to six years, which we everyone can agree on is still too long. Uh, and so I'll start working, uh, I'll start at the federal level uh, and work my way to the state level in terms of what we can work on. Uh, at the federal level, again, uh, it never hurts back to, to go back to what Debbie was talking about and say that Debbie was right in terms of, uh, let's talk about appropriations. Uh, how can we find increased funding for CDC and HRSA? Uh, I think it's important to note with CDC, when a condition is added to the RUSP, one of the first calls that state labs will make is to the CDC quality assurance program to understand, okay, I have to, we have to start preparing the screen for this condition. What is that process? Uh, and so increased funding for CDC because they do have grants available to have to help add conditions. So increased funding will allow for increased grants, which will allow for states to make it easier for states to add conditions. Uh, on the other side, uh, too often when we talk about newborn screening, and myself, uh, I do this quite often myself, uh, we focus too much on the labs themselves as opposed to the new one screening as a whole. And so that's where HRSA comes in and it really helps with those follow-up services to make sure that we're getting contact uh, with the positive new one screening uh, babies to make, to make sure they come in for the confirmation testing. Uh, and then at the state level, there are really two aspects. Uh, and so we advocate uh, for what we call RESP alignment legislation. Uh, and so what this does is essentially just three parts. Uh, first, it requires auto inclusion. Essentially states that we know, we, we've heard so much about all the science and evidence driven approach that goes into getting on the RESP. If it's gone through all that, it should be on your state panel. And so essentially states that auto inclusion, if it's on the RUSP, it needs to be on your state panel. Uh, the second part is the timeline, really addressing this, how do we bring down that five to six year timeline? So we tend to advocate for about two and a half years. Uh, and the reason it is two and a half years is because it does some take some time uh, to get ready because we the state lab needs to determine if they need to hire uh, new staff, they need to determine if they have to procure new machines, they have to learn how to run the test properly, they have to learn the education behind the condition, the follow up, how to properly follow up around the condition. So all that takes time, it should not take five to six years, but it does take time. So that's where you get that two and a half year timeline is generally what is agreed, uh, what has been told to us is feasible. Uh, because when we do this legislation, we often are working with state labs to make sure that it is something that is doable. Uh, and lastly, if we're going to ask for auto inclusion, we're going to set a timeline. We want to make sure there's a long term funding source. And so this part varies most uh, state to state, but essentially it's stating if they want, we want to make sure that there's funding in place to add these conditions. That we're not stating you have to add this condition, you have to do it in two and a half years, and hopefully you can find the money. Now we want to make sure, okay, you have to do it in two and a half years, and here's how you're going to pay for it. Um, and then lastly, uh, in terms of what advocates on this call could do, uh, we always uh, talk about connecting with your state newborn screening program. Um, giving them a heads up, beginning that contact early. So for many within, the, I think Duchenne's a great example, uh, reaching out to your state labs now and, and talking to them now, like, just so you're aware, Duchenne is in the Rust nomination review process. Uh, we believe we have a strong package and it should be, and it can be added. So what questions do you have from us? How can we help you add Rust as quickly as possible? Uh, so I think it's, it's so important to, to open those lines of communication when possible. Yeah, absolutely, Dylan, 100%. Um, I'll, I'll just add to that kind of a bigger picture idea also that's being floated within some circles uh, for the future of uh, laboratory screening and newborn screening is the potential use of uh, regional labs or kind of centers of excellence of, of laboratories in which instead of 
50 different, or in the case of territories, I don't know how many we're up to, 56 or 57 if you include DC, um, uh, decisions having to be made in individual state labs or territorial labs need to uh, do that work. Maybe we can limit that down to some regional labs to do the bulk of it uh, so that every state doesn't have to bear that burden. I'm, ask, I'm, I'm adding that in because I know I was going to ask you about that, but I think we only have one uh, time for one more question from uh, for, for you, and that's pertaining to the actual technology being used within the screening process itself, because there's some really exciting opportunities within uh, the possibility of uh, using gene panels or whole genome sequencing. So uh, in in uh, let's let's say 120 seconds, if you can, what financial regulatory and bio, bioethical issues would using genetic testing have with the newborn screening, and that's such an impossible thing I'm, I'm posing to you yeah. to, for you to do it within two minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, as quickly I'm, as you can. I'm going to take 20 seconds of those just to, to briefly say when we're talking about two panels of genomic testing, we need to make sure that they're fitting into the current newborn screening system. We can't complete this. We're not building something from scratch. We have to find a way that fits in. Uh, and so in terms of financial, it's how do we pay for, uh, do we need to pay for new machines? Regulatory, how do we ensure the fact that this is the testing is being done properly? If you're setting up gene panels, how do you make sure they add it properly? Uh, when talking about gene panels, you also have to talk about equity. How do we make sure that we have the right variants on those gene panels to make sure that you're not uh, only identifying in, in majority white populations? So you have to talk about that. That also kind of bleeds into the bioethical conversation uh, in terms of equity, but also in terms of storage of data. This is uh, a big conversation with anyone screening in general. Uh, but it's how do we, if you're doing the whole genome sequence and you have all that data, what are you doing with that data? How are you storing it? What are the, what's the proper uh, protections on that? And so on. And so a lot of that already exists within newborn screening. Uh, there are, these are de-identified dried blood spots. And, and so that already is there. But when you kind of move up that next level to genomic testing, uh, you have to, you have those additional concerns. And so you, it's something that is being addressed currently, uh, but it's one of those things that I always want to, Really, right. I started with, and I'll end with it. Uh, and when talking about genomic testing, you, we need to make sure that we're talking about not just how cool and how impactful the technology can be, because it is and it will be. Uh, but how does it fit into the current system, and how can we make sure that we're not creating inequity across state lines because you don't see because state X has the funding to add it, but state Y does not. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, well said, and it's also important to remember genetic testing in many ways is actually already part of newborn screening within the confirmatory analysis. If the screen comes back as positive uh, as part of newborn screening, there is that confirmatory diagnostic that needs to be run to actually confirm, uh, in many cases at the very least, for many of these genetic conditions, the underlying diagnosis. That would be true if Duchenne muscular dystrophy was indeed added to uh, panels and that we have the CKMM screen that Nikki told us about. But then from there, if it comes back positive, there would be a genetic test. Uh, that would be run to actually confirm the diagnosis of Duchenne or potentially a diagnosis of other another neuromuscular disease for that matter. So genetic testing and genomic sequencing are already part of newborn screening, but if we're talking about that's the first step rather than that's the confirmatory test, uh, that's where we get into these complexities, Dylan, that you that you all outlined. So that is all the questions that I have uh, for you, Dylan, and we do have one question in the box, uh, the Q&A box from John, but before we get there, uh, let's move to one final slide on how you all can help us. So uh, we need your help. We talked a lot about different ways in which uh, you can support uh, the work that's being done with the newborn screening and with the neuromuscular diseases. Our one ask of you for today, at the very least, is the ask that uh, Debbie started out with, which was to urge your law lawmakers and in particular your senators support the newborn screening saves lives reauthorization act. Think about what state you're in. If you have a senator that is especially a Republican for that matter, but also Democratic senators for that matter, shoot them a note. Shoot them a note by going to mda.org backslash advocacy uh, on, on why newborn screening is important to you. We have a template there for you. Add your own personal story, add your own personal reasons, send that over, and that's going to make it all the more likely, hopefully, that the Senate will actually pass this reauthorization. So uh, we can speed up the process of adding new conditions so that we can have the federal government sending more money to the states so we can do all these amazing things that Debbie, Nikki, and, and Dylan gave an overview of. So we have one question in the Q&A. And again, if anyone has some last burning questions, submit them uh, right now, because otherwise we will finish up because we're already six minutes over. Um, but Dylan, I wanted your help uh, answering this one, which is why I saved it to the end. And I'll take the first crack at it. But the question is, do you, uh, and this is from John, uh, do you see states that screen for a specific condition, but then Medicaid not cover the treatment? So uh, for many of the diseases that are being screened for 
at the state level, um, these are conditions with an FDA approved treatment uh, that uh, is the treatment that uh, essentially had qualified that condition for newborn screening. And consequently, with the Medicaid programs, uh, Medicaid programs are actually required to cover new FDA approved treatments uh, based upon the Medicaid uh, rebate program, essentially. And it gets a lot more complex than just that, but essentially, if you really dive down deep into it, or if you really just take it at its kind of most basic nature, Medicaid programs have to cover FDA approved treatments. Now, they can slow walk it, they can cause a lot of, uh, they can put delays in the process, they can put uh, checks in the process, uh, which can be problematic, but by and large, if uh, a disease that's been added to a newborn screening panel has a treatment that that treatment is FDA approved, that Medicaid program uh, in one way, shape or form eventually uh, essentially has to cover uh, that treatment. Now, I know I said that in, in the simplest, perhaps overly simplified way. Dylan, would you want to add anything to what I had to say there? Uh, two things. First, I love that phrase of slow walk. Um, but I think it would also apply to there are some states that will slow walk the addition of a pan of a condition to their panel because of this exact question. So I think that you'll also see that at times. Uh, I, I do want to flag that it's not common. I have not heard too many instances of this happening. I was like this to say that doesn't happen, I think would be misleading, but to say that happens frequently, I think would also be misleading. I think it's a, an issue that we track uh, and, and don't see it happen too often. Um, but the one thing where we do see it happen more often is uh, often when we're talking about treatment, uh, we uh, associate with an FDA approved treatment. Um, within newborn screening, you just need a care, essentially a care standard. And so for a lot of uh, earlier newborn screening conditions, uh, that is essentially a, a diet. So there are many bowel conditions that in PKU, uh, those are always a great example of to use because it is the original newborn screening condition. Uh, if you, just take these certain medical foods, then the uh, signs and symptoms associated with your condition will never develop because essentially your body is just un unable to break down a certain amino acid. Uh, those medical foods are often not covered. Uh, and for those who ever wanted to be active in this space, there is the Medical Nutrition Equity Act uh, that is active uh, in both the House and the Senate uh, that would help to increase coverage for those medical foods. Uh, and so you do see it sometimes around medical foods at the state level. Um, but that's mostly where you see it in terms of FDA approved treatments to Paul's point. You, you typically do see it covered uh, once it's officially added to the panel. Yep, absolutely. Very good answer, Dylan. Thanks for, for cleaning up what I may, may have missed there, certainly. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, we are out of questions and we're nine minutes over time. So we really should conclude. Uh, Debbie, Nikki, Dylan, thank you so much for your time this evening. I know those on the line uh, live, as well as those who are going to be watching uh, the recording afterwards, are, are quite appreciative of of your expertise and of your knowledge uh, being lent to everyone this evening. Uh, thank you again for the collaboration on newborn screening.